welcome to uh, Protocols in Action. We created Protocols in Action to acquaint practitioners with protocols that other practitioners in the trenches, as they are, are using to improve patient health. I am Dennis Schoen, and I'm the founder of Research Nutritionals, and I founded the company to, to raise the bar and bring more science into, into our space. So we actually produce products, and we have clinical research done at major universities or research institutes with the idea that when we're done, both the patient and the practitioner will have a better idea how our products will work for their patients. It should not be such a guessing game. We know that everybody is unique and, and we all have different DNA. However, we can make it so it works better and is, again, not as much of a guessing game. And from a formulation standpoint, we really work at not working with just a fat ingredient or a single mechanism, but we use multiple mechanisms in all the products that we put together so that we have much greater chance of, of helping patients because the body's way too complicated to say that, hey, a single ingredient is going to fix a patient. I mean, that's just, that, that's just not reality out there. So anyway, I'm proud to uh, introduce you. Today's guest is Kelly McCann, and I've known Dr. McCann for many years and have always been impressed with her ability to work with these really difficult patients and to really help people. And she's a very intelligent and a very warm uh, individual. And I can see why her, why her patients probably like working with her quite a bit. She's a, a functional and integrative practitioner. Um, she utilizes her extensive knowledge of most causes and treatments in her thriving practice. Uh, I should say knowledge of root causes and treatments in her, in her thriving practice. The Spring Center, which is located in Costa Mesa, California. She's a graduate of Tulane University School of Medicine and School of Public Health. She completed a combined residency program in internal medicine and pediatrics in Arizona. She is one of 35 graduates from the residential fellowship at the Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona and is also certified in functional medicine uh, and medical acupuncture. She's on the board of directors for two professional organizations, the Academy, excuse me, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine and the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. Dr. McCann loves sharing her knowledge through lectures, podcasts, summit appearances, and social media. She was the host of many manifestations of mast cell activation syndrome summit and co-host of the Allergy and Asthma Summit and the Mastering Mast Cell Activation Summit. She's currently working on a book for her patients as well. Welcome, Dr. McCann. Really happy to have you here with us. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for having me. Again, it's, believe me, it's our pleasure. So my experience in, in this space of over 30 years is that most practitioners who decide to really work with such difficult patients, there's something personal that's driving them into this, into this area. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with our listeners maybe just you know what brought you into this and and your motivations that would be great sure i'm happy happy to um there are many different variations on this story i was always interested in holistic medicine that's what we called it before i went to medical school and while i was in medical school it became alternative medicine um, and then it subsequently evolved from there integrative functional medicine and I always wanted to understand why. One of the aha moments in medical school and residency was we never were taught to ask the question, why is this patient experiencing these things? Um, it's all about you know, differential diagnoses and what are the tests and sending for surgery and medications, but nobody cared to ask why. And this is the most important question that patients have. Why do I have this? Right, And so in order to answer that question, you have to dive deep. Um, and that's where, that's where we find the answers of what's going on with them, why do they have this, and that's how we find the solutions for them too. Um, so that's one of the reasons. And you know, I've also had my own health journey. My family has ho had health journeys. And so I love to experiment on myself. I, I, do a, I do many of the things that the patients, that I ask the patients to do too, because you know, it, it helps not only build that rapport, but 
I can speak with much more authority when I say, okay, you need to go get a colonic. And they're like, okay, what the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> and it's something to look forward to. <laughs> oh yeah, good times. It's good times, but it works uh, in the right circumstances for the right indications, et cetera, right? So, um, so that's part of it. That's part of my story. <laughs> well, again, you know, good for you. And it's, we need people like you who, uh, who will dig deep and, and really try to figure out what the root causes are because it's tough. Um, again, I've been in the nutritional supplement space for 30 plus years. And it used to be when I was talking to practitioners such as yourself, it was, okay, well, we're dealing with this issue, so this is what we need to do. But it seems like that must have been either people weren't as complicated, they didn't have as many issues as they have now, or else it was, I don't know, just an unusual time in the history of mankind. I mean, what's your thought on this? I mean, why are people so ill at this point with so many different issues? You know, I, I think it's ultimately that we are bombarded by a variety of different toxic exposures. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of chemicals in the environment now. We are bathing in EMF on a regular basis. And, um, and, you know, and then mold is ubiquitous, especially here in Southern California. I lived in 10 houses and they have all been moldy. Um, and even studies as long ago as 2009 um, show that 85% of buildings in America, you know, your churches, your schools, your office buildings, 85% have some form of water damage. So where there's water damage, there's mold. I think that our bodies have just reached a t tipping point where we can't, the vast majority of people can't tolerate the constant insults that we're bathing in. And it's triggering conditions uh, such as mast cell activation syndrome in many, many patients. Um, and because of the multifactorial soup that we're uh, in in our environment, um, which also includes chronic infections. These things are all suppressing the immune system, jacking up the nervous system, um, and then roll in the stressors of um, life and politics and social <laughs> media and uh, on and on and on uh, financial challenges for people um, between all of these things that are happening globally all at once. Um, people can't, we can't manage, we can't manage with the weight of the toxic exposures and the environmental uh, exposures and the, the emotional psychological burdens of stressors that we're uh, under right now. It, it, it's interesting because it seems to me in the past, we didn't look at the psychological burdens as you're suggesting. It was just, okay, what's the issue? Um, but it seems you're right, and I think we have a better idea that what's happening psychologically to us impacts us, you know, from a medical standpoint as well. Yes, and and I think that medicine has not yet caught up, um, even in the functional integrative medicine space. We haven't really caught up with this idea that we have to address. Um, the life stressors, the emotional, psychological, even spiritual piece of what it means to get sick. Um, I have a master's in spiritual psychology, so this is something that I love to talk about um, and yet recognize that it's an area where um, medicine hasn't really gone yet. You know, patients go to the medical doctor or the healthcare practitioner for their physical problems. And if they have emotional problems or psychological problems, they go to their therapist or their psychiatrist. If they have spiritual problems, they might go to their, you know, rabbi, priest, uh, pastor, guru, <laughs> you know, you name it, shaman. Um, but nobody's doing this and bringing it all together. And I think until we do that, we're, we're all missing the boat. We all have a piece of the puzzle and the puzzle needs to be put together, um, particularly with complex chronic illness. It, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, more and more wellness centers are opening up. 
and and they look at a lot of the different modalities. I mean, it would be you know it could often include obviously a medical doctor in there, an, an osteopath in there, a chiropractor, a naturopath, you know, acupuncturist or whatever. But I don't think I've seen one that includes like a psychologist or psychiatrist in there as well. I mean, it's just so interesting that instead of practicing independently for best results, guess what? We need all of it. Yes, we absolutely do need all of it. And I think there, there are some people who do that, um, that have a psychologist. I have a couple colleagues who have a bigger center and have the psychologist pieced in there too. But <clears throat> um, yeah, luckily, uh, spiritual psychology has given me a few tools that I can bring that, that conversation into my, my clinic space with patients to open up that that can of worms and feel really comfortable with it because um, what I find is that people get 80% better if you just focus on the physical. They will never fully reach their their optimal potential, find their joy, find their flow, unless you address or help them address the, the mind-body-spirit piece. That's, that's very cool. It's interesting, many, many years ago, one of my brothers is a clinical psychologist, and um, we were working a lot with practitioners uh, who were dealing with chronic fatigue syndrome. And, you know, of course, he would be seeing patients with, with chronic fatigue syndrome as well. And he said, you know, there may be physical manifestations, you know, things that need to be fixed physically. But with most people, I can see a psychological component as well, which is sort of obviously what you're saying, too, with any of these complex situations that you're dealing with. Right. And, you know, and I, and I, and I want to make sure that we're not saying, you know, it's all in your head, right? right that is right. not no, no, what no. I'm saying at all. What I'm finding with patients um, is that whether they have adverse childhood events, right, which we know link to complex to chronic illnesses, but even if you lived a healthy you had a healthy upbringing, your parents didn't beat you, you didn't, you know, they didn't get divorced. Um, there wasn't drugs and alcohol. Even if you had a healthy childhood, there are times where we get dismissed, discounted, um, you know, kind of pushed away, even by loving parents, right? And everybody has experienced that. When we were two, we were joyful little beings. Look at a two year old, they are filled with life and hope and joy and everything is exciting. And then they change because they get messages that that's not okay. That's not okay. That's not okay. There are little T traumas and these little T traumas turn into thoughts and impressions and beliefs about ourselves that then dictate how we are in the world and how we are in the world then will dictate what sort of physical issues we start to have. And then that becomes the, the health problems, right? Right. Um, In, in, interesting. So you were mentioning a little while ago, um, you know, these things are all layering on um, about mast cells. And, and, and it's interesting because, again, when, when I first started talking about mast cells a number of years ago, um, it, it was one of the additional layers, you know, in these very complicated patients. But most practitioners at the time that I would talk with were treating mast cell, I mean, we're treating the other issues first, whether it's Bartonella, you know, Borrelia, you know, Babesi, whatever it might be. But it seems like most practitioners now treat mast cell first. Is, is that what you do as well? Yes. Um, most of the time we have to. I mean, there are some patients who, who don't have mast cell, who don't have this hypersensitivity piece, but they're much fewer and far between, at least in my practice. Um, so yeah, we have to address the mast cells first because they're so hypervigilant that if you give a binder, for example, you're going to have terrible detox reactions or exacerbation of their underlying symptoms. If you try and treat um, Bartonella or Lyme, um, they're going to hurt horribly because those mast cells are so hypervigilant and poised for uh, danger. They see danger everywhere. And so until we address that 
immune system piece and pull down the mast cells and calm them down a little bit, make them a little bit happier, address the nervous system, so autonomic vagus nerve um, stimulation, getting people from sympathetic into parasympathetic, and also limbic retraining. Um, their nervous systems are so jacked up that um, that is really very difficult to start to address any treatments until things calm down a little bit. You know, when people eat five foods, you can't be giving them a mixture of supplements. Uh, some folks, um, you know, I have patients on the car carnivore diet and every, every, every medication is compounded and every supplement is as pure and um, individualized as possible and they're starting with sprinkles of things um, because that's the only way we're gonna make any progress. So since mast cell seems to be so prevalent with so many of your patients, how do you go about even testing it or treating it? Or and what is your approach? There are tests. The tests are um, imperfect. Um, mast cells produce hundreds, if not thousands, of mediators. Through commercial labs, we can test three things: <laughs> case, histamine, and chromogranin A. And insurances won't cover chromogranin A now unless you have some sort of endocrine tumor. So, um, so really two. And it's great when they're positive. Um, they are very well. His tryptase is rarely positive. Histamine is occasionally positive, and that's very helpful. Um, and it's just really supporting what I know to be a clinical diagnosis. Right. <clears throat> and there are other tests. I have a, a lab at my local uh, hospital where I've contacted the pathologist and we're able to do additional urine testing, 24-hour and, and spot urine testing for leukotriene, uh, leukotriene E4, prostaglandin D2, um, methyl histamine and several other markers. And I think that it's important. I think that it's important to have that option for patients. There is also a way to test biopsies with special stains. So if somebody has had an endoscopy or colonoscopy uh, or a cystoscopy of the bladder, you can request pathological stains. Um, the specific stain is called CD117. And so that's helpful at supporting the diagnosis as well, but pretty much it's a clinical diagnosis. Now, I will say there are a couple, there are two consensus uh, organizations on the diagnosis of mast cell activation. Um, there are the traditional allergists who got together and decided they were, they were going to tell the world how to diagnose mast cell activation, and their diagnosis criteria is um, an a tryptase level that elevates 20% plus or minus something uh, during a flare. And it's a very strict criteria. Most patients don't meet that criteria. <laughs> so if your patient goes to a, a conventional allergist and they just check a, check a tryptase and the allergist tells them, no, you don't have mast cell, get out of my office, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with you, um, have them seek out a consensus two doctor. So consensus two is Dr. Larry Afrin, Tanya Dempsey, um, and 40 some odd of, our, of our, other, our other colleagues who got together and said, okay, these are the criteria by which we diagnose mast cell activation. It's a much broader clinical diagnosis, which means that all of these patients who are struggling with all of these weird, wacky symptoms have a potential label and diagnosis, and therefore there are so many things that we can do to help them. Um, so I do think that's important to understand. Yeah, it, it's interesting. We so oftentimes it seems at the beginning of recognition of some new illness or infection or whatever that the the standard of care is such a basic approach to it, even in, in trying to figure out what it is, much less treating it. And I think, you know, again, you know, practitioners such as yourself who go a whole lot deeper are the ones who can really find out what's going on. And unfortunately, that's why so many patients go to so many practitioners until they find, you know, a, a doctor of last resort, sort of like you, to, to <laughs> help them with this. So, you know, again, good for you in doing that. 
So when when you're looking at mouse cell, then I mean, if you you know if you are using labs, I mean, which which labs would you suggest, or the, or which ones do you use? Well, as I said, um, tryptase and histamine through LabCorp request can be helpful. Um, most of the time, it's a clinical diagnosis. If you search um, mast cell consensus uh, on PubMed, Dr. Lawrence Afrin um, is the lead author, <clears throat> and it's it's on PubMed. You can access it as a as a person. Um, it's free, and then they have the supplemental as well, and that lists out the diagnostic criteria. Um, and it's pretty clear if somebody has mast cell when they walk in your room, um, if they check nearly every box in your review of systems, um, if they have fatigue, if they have palpitations, if they have headaches, if they have GI issues, if they have uh, neurologic or psychiatric issues, if they have uh, gynecologic issues, chances are they have mast cell activation. If Amazing they're on how, a, persuasive, <laughs> how pervasive it is. It, it's it's so pervasive, um, and these patients are suffering so much. They need so much help. Um, yeah, it's really it's really an important um, condition to learn about and learn how to treat and wrap your head around. Because unfortunately, I think it's only going to get worse. Just because of so many of the environmental issues yeah. out there. Yeah, and. Yeah. And, you know, until we clean up the planet, <laughs> uh, we're, we're heading towards a tsunami of chronic illness. Yeah, it's happening too quickly. The introduction to all of this and our body's not able to adapt to it in such a short period of time. No. And yet, you know, I do think that that's where the nervous system um, is really important. And the more that we're able to have those challenging conversations about shifting our nervous system to more parasympathetic to calm down the limbic system um, that will go a long way teaching kids how to meditate I mean I, I do I don't want to be a you know a naysayer and uh, a catastrophizer I think that there are ways out of this um, and it's going to take some work it's going to take some work at all levels of our society uh, not just through healthcare. Well, yeah, and no, I, I think you're right. It's complicated, and it's gonna it's gonna take a lot. You're you're absolutely right. So, when you're treating mast cell, what what do you tend to go for to help people? Um, there are so many different options. Um, I do I do um, check in with my intuition on a regular basis because I think it's important to um, help guide the art of medicine and figure out what's going to be best for people. Um, I will even teach some of my mast cell patients how to muscle, muscle check or muscle test themselves because uh, it's very empowering for them and something that they have been lacking in, in their lives is a sense of empowerment. Um, that being said, um, some of my favorite pharmaceuticals um, usually start with the H1 blockers. Um, oftentimes I'll find that um, one H blocker will be fantastic and another one won't work at all. So things like um, uh, Sertazine or Zyrtec, Zizol, those tend to be pretty similar and work in patients the same way. And then you have your Loratadine or your um, Claritin, Allegra, and then um, you can use H2 blockers. Um, I love trial of chromalin for people, particularly with GI issues, as it coats the gastrointestinal tract. Probably only works about 30% of the time, but when it does work, it's magic, so it's worth trying. I do use a lot of ketotophen with my patients. Uh, ketotophen is a compound-only mast cell prescription, so it has to be obtained from a compounding pharmacy. Um, LDN, actually, low-dose naltrexone, has been shown in clinical studies to be very helpful for a variety of different mast cell patients. Um, I'll use some oxytocin, uh, compounded oxytocin. I love, love oxytocin. Couldn't use more oxytocin and love in their life, right, <laughs> uh, to help calm down that brain. Um, and then, let's see, rupatidine, which is a... Um, antihistamine 
uh, platelet activating factor inhibitor that you can get through Canada works great for some patients. Um, those are probably the big guns in terms of pharmaceuticals. And then in terms of supplements, there are so many. Um, I know Research Nutritionals makes Histoquel, which is a beautiful product. Um, works really well for patients who are not quite as sensitive as some of the extreme sensitive patients, um, just because it's a combo product. Um, and then for the extremely sensitive people, I'll use an individual ingredients, quercetin, luteolin, um, Prilocid, um, DAO enzymes, um, low histamine probiotics, uh, resveratrol, pycnogenol are some of my favorites. Uh, PEA works really well too. Wonderful. Yeah, it's a great use of combination. You know, it's interesting on the Histocal product, we, we get a lot of inter and very positive feedback on that, but we also have a uh, clinical study underway at Northwestern University on that one now. So, nice. yeah, the, I mean, those, those usually take a good year or so, but, uh, but we're hoping uh, that you know, it comes out, out positively. We hear, again, a number of good things from practitioners on that. Um, it, you know, beyond mast cell, I mean, what are some of the other common issues that you see with your patients, your underlying conditions, I guess? So one of the things that I've been super interested in recently is... Um, is hypercoagulability and biofilms. And they actually interchange. So we know about biofilms from the Lyme world, right? And hopefully some of you in the Lyme world also know about hypercoagulability. Um, but did you know that when you're hypercoagulable, that reinforces the biofilm? So the biofilms are the protective coating that the bacteria make. And then for people who have a genetic predisposition for hypercoagulability will reinforce that biofilm with their own fibrin and make it that much more resistant. Oh, wow. awesome, right? So crazy. Um, I learned about this from a colleague, Ruth Chris, um, who's a wonderful nurse practitioner, mostly retired educator now uh, she's just a wealth of information and we started doing testing for patients who had um, who had interstitial cystitis or a lot of urinary symptoms and we started doing a specific test called um, next generation sequencing through a company called microgen DX and it just blew my mind Yep. So, <laughs> so when we think about um, looking for bacteria in the sinuses, in the urine, the gold standard has been culture, right? Culture technology is ancient. What the heck? Why is that gold standard? <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got PCR, which is a little bit better. But as I explained to patients, your PCR technology is only good as the probes that you have. You have 100 probes, you can find 100 different organisms. But with next generation sequencing, they flip the technology on its head and they look for the DNA sequence in the specimen and match it against a library of tens of thousands of organisms. So you can find so many different things. So what, we would, what, what we're doing with patients is when they have these symptoms, and oftentimes interstitial cystitis is a, is a common complaint in patients with mast cell, is to give them some biofilm busters. Baluk is one of my favorites, uh, which you guys also carry. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, um, and then do the next generation sequencing and see what's there. And it's like a... A microbial soup that is often there in many of these complex chronic patients and the cool thing about the the test results is we can also learn what are the appropriate antimicrobials um, right now they're just checking checking for bacteria and fungi but man I've just found some really fascinating organisms and then we know exactly how to treat them that's fantastic. So again, the name of the lab? It's called MicroGenDX. MicroGenDX. And where are they located? 
They are located, I think, in Florida. Yeah. Wow, fascinating. God, I mean, it's, it's a whole step above, right? You know, I don't know why everybody doesn't do this test. I don't know why insurance doesn't cover every... I mean, they're working with insurances. They're trying to get the name out there. Um, I actually did a piece with the owner of the company for an L.A. TV program, <laughs> which is really fun. Good for you. I mean, yeah, we need to get that out there. That's fantastic. I mean, you're going to be so much more accurate with with treating the patients once you really know oh, yeah. what they have. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's really crazy making that, you know, poor people, ha people have to wait until they have enough symptoms to go to the doctor, to get a culture, and then the culture says, okay, take Bactrim. Well, uh, and what we find is that, you know, well, if we think about it this way, if you if you put something on a petri dish, right? But say your petri dish is only going to feed a certain kind of bacteria, right? It's only going to feed a gram negative bacteria. What about all the fungus that might be there? I've found so much candida and so much yeast in people's bladders, you would you would die. Um, and it's never going to show up on a culture because they don't look for it on a culture. And these patients just suffer and suffer and suffer. So it's fascinating. Um, and, and prostate issues too. Men with prostate issues. Um, so, so many men have bacteria in the prostate. And you can't find that very easily. Um, and then you're shooting in the dark in terms of picking an antimicrobial to use. You have no idea if it's really gone. So this is just a game changer, this, this testing company. Um, and, and then the understanding of the biofilms. So the link to the hypercoagulability is that the vast majority of people who tend to have this biofilm organi uh, organism colonization in the bladder or the sinuses has a hypercoagulability. So then you have to go back and look at their genetics and look at their risk factors. Um, and then they might really need lifetime Baluk because they have a, they have a predisposition for hypercoagulability. Um, so it's, it's really cool and cutting edge to like put these pieces together. How long has that lab been around? Um, that I don't remember. Um, the, owner of the company is not a, um, Rick Martin is his name, he's not a medical person, um, but he found out about biofilms, you know, which were written about in the 1970s, right? right. <laughs> Dr. Costerton had been writing about biofilms for a very long time, and it's still not even in uh, conventional medicine. Maybe in the, like, wound care world, we recognize that there are polymicrobial wounds, but for the most part, um, it's biofilms are not uh, appropriately acknowledged. Um, and so he was really fascinated by this technology and took over the company, and he's just a wealth of information. That's, that's fascinating. Uh... You know, it sort of reminds me of the earlier days with David Berg. Did you ever work with him? He was the founder of Hemix Labs. And um, I saw him speak. Um, yeah, I, I didn't have the opportunity to work with Dennis Berg. Um, I rather studied with um, Ruth Chris, who studied with Dennis yeah, Berg. Yeah, Ruth used to be involved because it actually wasn't too long um, after I started the company that I got introduced to David Berg. And mm -hmm. it was fascinating studying about hypercoagulability and so we actually put on a joint conference with him and Ruth Chris spoke there and you know there are a number of practitioners who did but it was to me such an eye-opener at the time um, with, with what we could do and I, I think that's what we need is people who just think differently right mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting how he came around in this is that and then also how we started thinking about Baluki as well is that he, he was, you know, it's a lab that he had. And he had a lot of doctors coming to him running all sorts of tests. And it started originally with, um, with patients with, you know, with you know, fertility issues. And 
And then when he went back and analyzed it, and then he saw some of the doctors who were um, using Baluki, the lumbar kinase, um, to go to, you know, for these patients, they responded so much differently in their lab test um, on there. And so, but I think he came up with, I think it was like one out of five or 20% of the population is hypercoagulable. And so it's just the unfortunate genetics that people have that their blood is too thick. And that if we don't deal with that, then it's gonna be very difficult to heal other issues that are taking place at the same time. Yes, absolutely. And that's the same thing with the interstitial cystitis and these biofilms. Um, I think the statistics are up to about 25%. Uh, so Ruth talks about how LP, lipoprotein little a is one of those uh, risk factors for hypercoagulability, um, factor five Leiden, and then, you know, and of course, I'm also checking for protein S, protein C, antithrombin three uh, deficiencies. Um, but the one I want to talk about um, that I had not known about was plasma plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, or PI-1. And it's a, you can check for activity through LabCorp. Um, and the way that Ruth originally taught it was you check for activity, and if that's positive, then you check for the genetics. But I tended to use Quest more, and so I just went straight to the genetics. Um, what I actually found was that PI-1 antigen or PI-1 activity was elevated in people who had metabolic syndrome. Uh -huh. But it didn't correlate that they had PI-1 genetics. So the PI-1 genetics um, are so ubiquitous in the chronic uh, complex patient illness arena, I would say probably 90%. 85, 90% of my patients have at least one PI-1 gene mutation. Oh, wow. Which means all of them are hypercoagulable. All right. of them are at risk for these incredible biofilms. Everybody needs to be on Baluk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and what I'm seeing in the patterns is that people who have a family history of cardiovascular disease or cerebrovascular disease are very likely to have PI-1 gene variants. I have, uh, I'm homozygous. Uh, the 4G is the abnormal gene. Uh, the 5G is the normal gene. Um, both sets of grandparents all had strokes and heart attacks, um, which is not surprising. Um, and it also seemed to me just uh, looking at the, looking at the genetics, my patients who tended to be sicker, the ones who tended to have more, um, diagnoses, have more challenges improving, they tended to be more of the homozygous PI-1 genes. Interesting. Well, I guess, again, it's not surprising, but again, looking and delving into these other areas, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, for biofilms, we also developed a product called BioDisrupt. Yes. And it's a, it's a product that we had clinical research conducted on that also. And what we were doing was looking at uh, mass cell, I mean, excuse me, at biomass, so that, you know, how, how big the biofilm was, and the activity of the different biofilms. And it's amazing the impact you can have on that. I mean, it's, again, it's peer reviewed, but we showed a significant um, improvement in biofilms, you know, for a number of different, you know, bacteria or or virus or, or fungus or whatever, but you know, like you know, including candida, I mean, it's really pretty interesting. And then we were also testing biofilms for Borrelia with the biodisrupt, mm -hmm. and what could we do? And what was interesting, just like on the other the, diff the different staff ones that we did in addition to the candida, the the biofilms on um, on all of, all of these, uh, the more you the, you know, the more you titrate it up, the greater impact you had on the biofilm. What happened on um, Borrelia is sort of the opposite. The first time we introduced uh, BioDisrupt uh, with Borrelia, what we found was yes, we we obviously impacted you know mass and and activity. 
When we titrated up, though, we actually saw the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, wait a minute, something got contaminated. We had the researchers actually run the research again on that, and we got pretty close to the same response. So then we said, okay, maybe something's going on with the cytokines. So, I mean, this is supposed to be like a year study, and I think it was two and a half years by the time we got done with it. Oh, wow. And um, so, I mean, we need to understand what was happening. So when we looked at the cytokines, we saw there's some impact from the cytokines, but not enough to, to see the result that we were seeing. So we eventually ended up getting Eva Sappy involved in it. And, you know, she's done a lot of work in biofilms. And it was so funny because her response to us, you know, looking at what had happened in the earlier studies we had done, and then also the ingredients, she says, well, no, this is working for Borrelia. And then, you know, our researchers, when they were talking with her, said, yeah, but it's not working when we're applying more. So something's not quite right about this. And she said, no, what do we know about Borrelia? It changes shapes. It, it was, you know, it, it responds to the immune system going after it. So it's responding to it. And so you, you obviously threatened it. So now it's changing, and, you know, and, and that's why you're not having the impact you had before. So, so she said, you know, really when you're using it, you need to make sure with Borelli anyways that the timing is right with, with practitioners when they're using it. So with their treating and going after Borelia, you know, with whatever antibiotic they're choosing to use or any other type of treatment they're planning on using, making sure that they have that going and then giving the, you know, the bio disruptive, you know, so that we get some, some benefit from it. So then it opens it up. So then, you know, the, you know, the immune protocol that you're following actually has a better chance of succeeding with it. But it's very interesting. It was so different than, you know, than, than staph and candida. Right. So um, this, it sounds like pulsing the bio disrupt when you're going after uh, chronic infections like Borrelia make the most sense. Yeah, yep, I think that's another, well, that's another one that came out of the two. Well, that's, yeah, I agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just so interesting. But I mean, you don't know this until you try these things, right? That's why I'm, I mean, when, when we start a new study, I'm like a kid in the candy store, I love it. Because we're gonna learn so much that we didn't know before. It's really, it's just fun, it's, it's great to do. So anyway, but I like this lab. I'm gonna look up at the lab because I think that's really cool too, what you're working with. Yes, and if you want, I can introduce you to Rick. I'm happy to do yeah. that. He's oh, I'd love that. I think you guys would really hit it off. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of people are really interested in research like this. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very cool. So, so we, you know, we certainly talked about mast cell, um, and we started talking about coagulation. Um, so with your coagula coagulation patients, you're actually working with, with um, going for after the biofilms with them. Is there anything else you're doing with them? Um, so it depends. I actually screen everyone in the practice for um, a you know thrombotic or thrombophilic or hypercoagulable state. I use a couple of labs, either through LabCorp or Quest. Um, I check a fibrinogen activity because I want to see if they have elevated levels of fibrinogen. Um, I do. Would, um, I do also check a prothrombin fragment one plus two through LabCorp, it's one dot two uh, through Quest. And that, as I was taught uh, by Ruth, was <clears throat> indicating that there was an active uh, increased clotting risk. So it's the fibrogen or fibrin split products um, that are accumulating um, and that tells us that people are actively making clots. And so if they are actively making clots, um, then you know we wanna investigate more and do the hypercoagulable workup. Or if they happen to have urinary symptoms or what we're finding a lot in our mold patients is that they have colonization in their sinuses that can be bacterial um, as well as fungal. So Richie Shoemaker taught everyone about Marcons, and you know if people are Shoemaker uh, followers, they're going to test for Marcons. Let me tell you, there's a heck of a lot more in the nasal <laughs> microbiome than Marcons, right? Um, and you don't know it's there until you do a much more accurate test, like uh, the microdendiac sinus test. Um, 
So what we do is we give people, you know, five days of a biofilm buster like Bile Disrupt, um, and then we have them do the sinus swab, or they come back in, in the office and do the sinus swab. Um, and the nice thing is you can compound um, antimicrobial um, treatments for them based on the results. So it could be like a bacitracin, vancomycin mix, or bacitracin, um, clindamycin mix, or they may need uh, antifungals, and then you know which fungus is there. The other thing that we're also finding is <clears throat> Shoemaker has moved on and started talking about these, these uh, gram-positive bacteria called actinomycetes, um, still a little controversial, but I'm finding it in people's noses, in people's bladders, in people's prostates. Wow. So they're colonized with these coronium bacterium bacteria, and they're highly resistant to a lot of antimicrobials. Um, usually they're at low percent, and they're not oftentimes in the first or second it's not even third round of testing um, you know so sometimes we have to like go through the layers but they're there and so then that like pulls together this idea that okay this is a mold exposed person maybe they're having chronic inflammatory response syndrome to, not just to mold and mycotoxins but maybe the actinos are causing causing some issues too so it's just opening up many more questions <laughs> about how to help these patients get better. Well, well, I mean, it's great how in-depth you go with all this, but you have to see so much on top of it. You know, the latest developments, the latest science, you know, the finding the right labs like you're doing, that's, that's fantastic. Good, good for you. Oh, it's, it's like you described, you know, I get excited about it. I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> hey, there's a chronium bacterium tubercularistericum in this person's nose. We have to do an actinose test, and then I have to learn about what what to do about actinos, because I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's fantastic. And I, you know, I understand, I mean, you also have a, a, a mast cell activation syndrome masterclass, right? I do, yes. Um, I created a masterclass. It's really focusing on identifying what are the potential environmental toxicants that could be driving things for patients because I think that that was the big um, the big piece that was missing for a lot of patients like okay I know I'm in mold and I've got mast cell mm -hmm. well what about what about your personal care products what about the you know the cooking pans and pots that you use are they you know do they have um, non-stick coating on them and therefore you're getting exposed to all the PFOSs and PFASs. Um, what kind of hair care products are you using? Do you use the Brazilian blowout? <laughs> like, um, do you park your car in your garage? Is your garage attached to your house? Then you're getting all of these VOCs in your house which trigger a lot of mast cells. You know it's interesting um, environmental medicine doctors took care of patients with multiple chemical sensitivity many years ago, right? Bill Ray, Environmental Health Center of Dallas, um, he, he talked about mold before Shoemaker, right? So people have been talking about mold for a long time, but he also talked about uh, environmental chemicals and, and multiple chemical sensitivity. He has a four book series on multiple chemical sensitivity Multiple chemical sensitivity is mast cell activation. Wow. Um, there's a, a, a woman researcher, Claudia Miller, PhD. She, uh, she came up with the Queasy questionnaire looking at multiple chemical sensitivity. And it's a series of questions that you ask yourself, you know, um, not all patients with mast cell activation have multiple chemical sensitivities. But I'm pretty damn sure that every patient who has multiple chemical sensitivity has mast cell activation. Um, that's just that's just how it is. I think we now understand the pathophysiology of what's happening. Um, the other interesting thing is <clears throat> there's medical literature that ties multiple chemical sensitivity to environment. I'm sorry. Uh, EMF hypersensitivity, but there is not yet any medical literature that ties 
uh, EMF, hypersensitivity syndrome, to mast cell activation. It is the same pathological pathway, I think. Well, it, you know, it, it, it hasn't been figured out yet or proven yet. But hasn't it hasn't been proven right? out yet. <laughs> it hasn't been proven yet. But nobody's actually pulling those pieces together, right? So they're taking... They're taking multiple chemical sensitivity and tying it to mast cell, and they're taking multiple chemical sensitivity and tying it to EHS, with environmental, I'm sorry, uh, EMF hypersensitivity, but you've got to complete that loop, I think. Well, well I, I'm sure you know, people signing up for that class would do well by it. Um, you're obviously so well-versed in all of this. You understand the interconnectedness of all of, you know, all, all of these different things. I mean, it's... That's impressive, Kelly. It really is impressive, and I think you know one reason I respect you anyway. But um, besides, you're I think you're a great human being, but you're just so knowledgeable on it, and you're helping so many people. So, you know, thank you for that, and and thank you for being a guest with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun. I've enjoyed myself a great deal. All right, Kelly. You have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.